Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Cord Blood Association's um, first webinar. Really delighted that you've decided to attend and we hope that you'll have a productive uh, hour and a half with us today. I'm Joanne Kurtzberg and I'm the president of the Cord Blood Association and also um, the director of the Carolinas Cord Blood Bank, which is a FDA approved public cord blood bank. And today our webinar is going to be about the future of cord blood banking and the errors of immune effector cell therapies and regenerative medicine. Our speakers are Marcy Finney, who's the executive director of the Cleveland Cord Blood Bank, Colleen Delaney, who's the founder and chief scientific officer of Devera Therapeutics, and me. Um, and I already told you who I am. Each speaker will speak for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have uh, questions and answers following all of the presentations. Uh, you can, if you have a question, please enter it into the QA chat box and we'll address it at the end of the webinar. A couple of words about the Cord Blood Association. Um, it's an international nonprofit organization that promotes both public and family cord blood banking and accelerates the use of cord blood and birthing tissues to benefit patients and advance medicine. We have many members, both uh, private banks, family banks, public banks, hybrid banks, uh, industry partners, accrediting agencies, foundations, um, and many of the organizations you see in the logos on this slide. We're always happy to have more members um, because the more members we have, the more we can do. I wanna bring your attention to our annual meeting, um, which uh, will be September 6th to 8th, 2024. Um, at the Lowe's Miami Beach Hotel in Miami Beach, Florida. This is where we've had all of our meetings and it's a very nice location. And it's been a great um, opportunity to bring members of the community together. And I also wanna just leave you with the idea that we'd love to have you submit abstracts for the meeting. Uh, the deadline is June 16th um, and um, three best abstract um, awards, awardees will be uh, determined and be provided with um, enhancements to come to the meeting. But we welcome your abstracts and we also welcome your membership in the Court Blood Association. Okay, now we'll move to our first speaker, Marcy Finney from the Cleveland Court Blood Center. And Marcy is going to talk about modeling of cord blood banking to meet the demands of the future. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here today. I'm uh, excited to talk about this topic with you. So, you know, cord blood banking in the first era of um, banking really focused on some basic things to get the industry moving. Expense control, industry growth, inventory growth, and really focused on hematopoietic reconstitution. Many of the banks were often um, established based on geography or their key opinion leaders that used cord blood as a hematopoietic uh, source for cells. Um, and then the banks also really focused on quality, um, their accreditations and getting licensure. So that first era really brought some huge accomplishments. You know, cord blood banks could continue to collect, store, qualify and process cord blood units annually. There's over 5 million cord blood units in family and private banks, public bank, private banks. There's over 800,000 cord blood units listed on the registries from public banks. So far, there have been over 35,000 cord blood transplants performed worldwide. And the banks have a high rate of accreditation and licensure by both the AABB, FACT, and the FDA. Right now, the current utilization rates support the existing inventory, and there's been continued year-over-year -year growth of that inventory. Um, that first era really led to the fact that the cord blood units that are banked in the banking system are really highly characterized. Uh, they know a lot about the maternal donors. They are safe. They're um, tested for bacterial infectious disease when required. They know their Banks know the purest 
purity and potency of those units, including the TNC and viability and the stem cell with CD34 count. Um, and they know the identity. There's HLA testing done on them, the ABO and RH are required. Um, another thing that's happened through that first era is that it's a highly regulated product, right? There are um, accreditation agencies across the globe that work on uh, cord blood. Um, in 2011, cord blood was considered a drug under Section 351 of the FDA regulations. Uh, right now, 19% of the available inventory is licensed by the FDA, and the, currently there are eight public cord blood banks in the U.S. with an FDA license. This graph from the WMDA shows the use of um, all stem cell trans or sources for transplant over the last uh, couple of decades. And you can see the use of cord blood is kind of leveled off, but uh, if you look overall, uh, it's still a, a large number of transplants, uh, grossly 10% of all of the overall transplants. So in this first uh, era of cord blood transplant, there's kind of a, a, a journey of cord bloods from those cord blood donors. And I also show a couple of the different um, agencies that have helped to get this first era off the ground under each of these uh, sidebars. So it goes from cord blood donors to cord blood banks and then to the registries and there are different registries uh, depending on where, uh, what part of the world you're in. And then those cord blood units go to transplant centers and then they end up with the cord blood recipients. So the cord blood journey now has become a little bit different, right? There are also developers that intend to use cord blood as starting material for their cell therapies. So although there's still space for the donors and the banks and the registries, there's that intermediate step with developers. Uh, and it might go through the registry, it might come directly from cord blood banks. And I think that's this new era that we're all trying to learn about right now. Also, the treatment might not just be at a transplant center, right? It might be a treatment for something new um, outside of uh, hematopoietic reconstitution. So uh, I changed it from, you know, transplant centers to medical facilities. But at the end of the road, you know, those cord blood recipients still looks the same. So what does that model look like in the future? You know, um, I think what banks need to do for those future uses is modernize the donor recruitment. Uh, work on what makes the best inventory and that might look different now than it has before. Uh, I think it's re uh, responsible for banks to plan for increased demand. Banks need to diversify their revenue streams and their partners. Uh, banks could think about new products that might come out of core blood and could, should consider collaborations and also should consider the impact of cell therapy on their operations. So today I really wanted to focus on a couple of those things. I want to talk a little bit about the donor consent model and some bank operation models, and then let us think a little bit about modeling collaborations that might be able to increase that utilization in the long run. So first, let's think a little bit about donor consent models and what might need to look different in this new era. Uh, we probably need to do some work on modernizing consents. A lot of banks have done it, but I think it's always a good topic to talk about. And then um, I'm going to give a couple examples about reconsenting uh, existing donors. So I think as we talk about donors, it's always a good reminder to talk a little bit about the fact that there's low risk to donors in cord blood connection, collection. And, you know, that's not insignificant. Cord blood collection takes place after the baby's delivered and the cord is cut. That cord blood is normally thrown away as medical waste, and that collection doesn't interfere with the delivery of the baby. So a modern consent, you know, when we first started cord blood banking, you know, we were thinking about consenting donors to donate their cord blood to be used for hematopoietic reconstitution or stem cell transplant, you know, which is one piece of this. Um, I've included this graph because, you know, now as we think about um, consenting donors, their cord blood unit could be used at anywhere along this trail from research and development all the way through to clinical use with an FDA approved product. So I think as we think about consents, we need to make sure that we're talking to donors about possible use and all the different things that it might be. 
um, about ownership and how it might transfer from the bank to someone else along the way. Obviously, banks have a huge responsibility to make sure that those um, third parties that are going to get those units meet all of the requirements and regulatory issues. Um, what reimbursement looks like, because, you know, uh, even public core blood banks do get some reimbursement when core blood units are used. And that language has to be comprehensible to all donors. And that's a challenge because it's a diff it's a it's a complex um, industry. I can give an example in my particular cord blood bank. We uh, modernized our consent and we were really transparent about the things that might happen with their cord blood, including commercial partners, including using it with third parties, including research and development. We do give donors a chance to choose. And we weren't actually sure if that would make our um, consenting decrease, but we haven't really seen a huge decrease. It makes the conversations more robust. Uh, but we've seen that I think donors are appreciative of knowing all the things that might happen. A few years ago, there was a subgroup in the Corbett Advisory Group that worked on some generic language that uh, banks could use in their consent form to try to explain all of those different things that might happen. And this language um, talks to the donors about the fact that it could be used for stem cell transplant, it could be used for research or in commercial products. Um, and it does uh, include language that's really clear that there won't be any financial payment to the donors and that um, once you donate it, we can't guarantee that we could get it back, right? If somebody's already used it, uh, we can't return it once it's been used. So I think those are important conversations and important language to have. Uh, there's also the possibility, we've had some requests, and I think it's happened in the field more and more, to use thing, uh, cord blood units for different things that we didn't even think about when we um, started consenting donors you know, 15 or 20 years ago. We had a um, re uh, request to use cord blood as a starting material for iPSC cells. And our experience was, um, we thought that that was gonna need a, a conversation with the actual donors. So we had an agreement with this third party to do this work. Uh, we underwent training with our um, collection coordinators, our hospital liaisons that were gonna to talk to the donors. We uh, went through uh, extensive approval for all the documents that would be involved, including FAQs and the uh, reconsent itself. And then we started some donor outreach and then we actually documented the reconsent. So in our experience, we had no idea what would happen. Um, we attempted to talk with 14 donors that had donated their cord bloods to our bank in Cleveland. Of those 14 donors, eight of them reconsented, which meant they actually had a couple conversations. They were sent um, documents to sign and return, and they did that. So uh, we were actually, it fostered some really interesting and excellent conversations with some of the donors. Some of them were ecstatic that they were going to be part of this. Of the 14 that we uh, contacted, three never responded at all. So we don't actually really know if we had the right contact information or not. Three also responded and said that they would do this. We mailed them the information and then we never got it back. So uh, it might be a passive no with those three, but uh, I feel like overall, um, this reconsent process is something that we should at least consider in the future if there's something that we felt like we really needed to talk to a donor about. The next model I wanted to talk a little bit about was um, for bank operations is inventory and um, at least thinking about how these new um, partnerships can diversify your revenue. So I think all banks are maybe generally categorized, categorized into these three inventory management models. One, you're in a growth strategy where you're trying to grow your inventory. Uh, two, you're in a replacement strategy where you have an optimal inventory for your particular bank. And as units go out, you bring new units in. Or um, there are some banks that are in a distribution only mode where they don't bring in any new uh, cord blood units. They simply just are distributing units that they already have in their inventory. So I could give you an example again at our bank. Uh, we made... Uh, a plan to do some strategic inventory management uh, 
probably seven or eight years ago, where we recognized that there were two main things that we wanted to focus on in our inventory. One was having high TNC units. And the second, which is not represented in this chart, was to also have a diverse inventory from different uh, donors from um, ethnic backgrounds. We'll talk just about the TNC part. So uh, you could see in the green bars, uh, that is a percentage of the overarching inventory of the National Mayor Donor Program that is in that bucket of TNC uh, by percentage. And you can see the largest green bar is 42%, which is in the 90 to 124 TNC bar. The blue bars represent where Cleveland's inventory is. And you can see that it's a little bit split, but our, the majority of our inventory is in the 125 to 149 or the 150 to 199. The thing to note is that the yellow line shows where the most units were shipped overarchingly from the NMDP. So we did succeed in um, having the most units in our inventory in the place where the most units were shipped. I will say that one thing that's a little bit misrepresented in this graph are those 300 and above. Even though there's not very many there, they really turn over quickly. So as they get uh, banked, they get used for transplant really fast. So I think everyone understands that you want to be, you know, on the um, that side of this graph. But our work to do that paid off for us and we have managed to get our inventory in the right TNC range. This is a busy slide and it's not, I'm not going to go through it all um, in detail. What I want to draw your attention to is that also in 2018, our particular bank did a new strategic plan where we recognized that just relying on clinical UCBs for transplant was not going to be a sustainable model for our bank financially. So we uh, did this whole strategic plan where we wanted to go and make sure that we were utilizing the units that were coming to our bank as best as we could. We wanted to go into a replacement strategy for our inventory. We're growing, but slower than we had before 2018. And then we also wanted to try to get some different partners that would um, use our cord blood, especially for research. So you, I think the main take home from this is if you look at the 2017 par graph, you'll see that the biggest piece of the pie is that orange pie, which is from clinical UCBs. If you look at the second pie, um, now the blue pie, is, which is our federal our foundation grants has stayed the same, but you can look at the other half of that pie and it is diversified with several other different funding mechanisms and different partners that use cord blood for different things. So uh, with that strategic plan, we did manage to uh, change what our revenue looks like. And it also grew by 27% over that time frame. So we also view that as a success for our bank. So the last model I wanted to talk about is uh, how we can model collaborations that might be able to increase some demand for the cord blood units and these inventories. So, you know, there's many potential applications and the two pre presentations we're gonna hear later are gonna talk about some of these, so I'm not gonna to talk too much about it, but there are a lot of things on the horizon, a lot of things being investigated. So, um, no, sorry about that. Uh, we also need to think about cord blood as starting material for these new applications. And, you know, our current collection and processing and storage methods are all optimized for traditional transplant. I think there's room for us to think about new models of how we might do that differently to serve uh, new applications. I think it's also important that when developers come to banks or to registries, they really need to understand their needs and can be able to communicate them exactly because, uh, I think it's important to really know exactly what you need, including the potential number that you might need, because that makes a difference. Um, and also that Corbett banks have the capacity to do prospective banking, provided there's enough resources and there's enough commitment from a new type of application. So this stack graph shows um, that this is data from our bank, but I believe that it's probably eerily similar for other banks. Um, but Corbett banks could, easily uh, respond to increased demand. The large bar is how many units we collected last year. And then the next bar is how many units we sent out to research, which is a little bit less than half. We processed a small number of them of less than 10% last year. Um, there's some attrition to what we process and what actually gets listed. 
And then that really tiny line shows the small number that were actually distributed for uh, transplant. So we have room in here to actually change what units are processed where uh, if we have a new application. Uh, we have chosen to keep our collection numbers high and then try to find alternative uses for them besides just uh, cryopreservation. But I think all banks have this capacity to increase um, if they had a new need that was uh, brought to light. Uh, Joanne already showed this slide, but you know, this Cordlet Association does a, an excellent job of connecting developers with Cordlet banks. And you can see by all of the different things that are in this slide that are brought together through the Cordlet Association in order for us to have these conversations about modeling and about what developers need and what banks can deliver. Another good resource is the NMDP Biotherapies Core Blood Bank Alliance. And the intent of this is to offer a single point of access for core blood units that are needed for allogeneic cell therapy development. Um, the Core Blood Bank Alliance qualifies and contracts with high performing core blood banks that are motivated to supply their core blood units for emerging cell therapies. And the beauty of this, as you can see the banks that participate in the logos below, is that for a developer, ideally you could go and have a one-stop shop where you could access core blood units from all of these different banks in one spot. So some of my final thoughts is that I think we are in a new era of core blood and we need to ensure that the use of Cordlet for stem cell therapies is optimized. Uh, banks need to adapt for wider applications. We need to utilize the existing organizations to collaborate. It's really important to connect Cordlet banks with developers so they can have these conversations. And then um, it's important that we work with developers to establish what their raw material supply needs are and how we can meet them. We should really capitalize on the existing experience that we all have with stem cell transplant. We have the capability to ship cord blood units anywhere on short notice. Uh, all the cord blood banks have regulatory knowledge and experience. And I think lastly, we need to better utilize cord blood banks experience and capabilities for these new applications. And lastly, I, do, I wouldn't want to end without thanking um, all of the people at my bank that work so tires, tirelessly to get core blood units to on the registry and to researchers and all the folks that are in the core blood banking field. You know, this is a thankless job a lot of times for the banks. We don't actually get to see the people very much. But this slide also shows um, some of the people that we do know that have shared their stories with us. And they have all different amazing stories and are all living really wonderful lives because of core blood. So thank you for your attention. I think we're going to do questions at the end. So next, I'm going to introduce Dr. Colleen Delaney. She has a lot of titles there on the bottom of her slide, so I'm not going to go through them. But she is a trained oncologist and a stem cell transplant physician and developer who has been in the field for a long time. And so I'm excited to hear um, her talk to us today about cord blood derived immunotherapies. Thanks, Marcy. Uh, not that long. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so thanks everyone for listening in to this webinar today. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I'm going to talk about, as Marcy said, the generation of immune effector cells from pooled donor cord blood CD34 positive cells. This is work we've been doing for a long time. <clears throat> and on the bottom there, you can see the multiple titles that I hold uh, and for full disclosure, both at Devera and at Coeptus Therapeutics, in addition to um, my time seeing patients. Okay, so today what we're going to talk about is the exciting, what I see as the exciting activity that is increasing in the cancer cell therapy landscape and beyond. I think we've all heard more recently about all the excitement of using cellular therapies and immunotherapies for autoimmune diseases, and I think this is all just the tip of, of the iceberg. So you're going to hear me talk a little bit about what we're doing in this space, but <clears throat> after me, Joanne will talk about cord blood derived therapies for neurologic um, conditions. So this slide, although getting a little bit older, um, demonstrates the year to year growth that's been occurring in this space. And when you look at this, you can see that the CAR T space still has the largest number of products under development. Um, however, you can see that NK cells are following closely behind as well as a number of other T cell related therapies 
and then this nice little basket um, of other cellular uh, therapies. So this is pretty exciting, a pretty exciting time for us. Uh, in addition to this, if we break this down a little bit more, <clears throat> what you can see here is uh, from the same publication that we're seeing an increase in the number of therapies that are being developed. And while the autologous products still greatly outnumber the allogeneic cell therapies, the number of allogeneic cell therapies, especially those beyond phase one, are increasing um, tremendously. And we don't really know what these undisclosed ones are, but I have a feeling they're on the allogeneic side um, of things. And then this slide um, shows, it is, is a table that was put together by Jeffrey Martin. If you're on LinkedIn, you can see he makes a lot of these nice visuals in the cell therapy space. And this is one such example of a slide that he put together, looking at companies that are developing NK cell therapies. And these NK cell, cell therapies are not modified or engineered. And you can see there's a number of companies, but what you can also see here is that the cell source um, that is noted here is primarily peripheral blood. And these, these therapies are primarily um, allogeneic. So Marcy really did a great job setting the stage for you know, the cord blood banking piece and how important it is for cord blood uh, product developers. And today I'm gonna to discuss the platform that we've been using to generate these cellular immunotherapies from cord blood um, and the advantages as I see it for using cord blood as a starting source material. Okay, so before we do that first, why allogeneic um, autologous therapies have clearly, in particular, AutoCAR-T, a number of them have been um, FDA approved. Uh, they are clearly saving lives. So why is there a big push for us to develop allogeneic cell therapies? Um, so despite the fact that autologous therapies have been transformative and I think have absolutely, without a doubt, shown the power of cellular immunotherapies to cure disease, there are, there are still many limitations to this approach. And I've tried to list them, uh, an overview of them here. So the, the starting material sometimes isn't as high quality, uh, which is not surprising given the fact that this is coming from cancer patients who have undergone multiple treatments and the ability to scale and bank fully released qualified products really just isn't there, right? So this means that it takes longer to get products to patients, it's more expensive <clears throat> to manufacture, and then you know we can't optimize for quality control because all of this is happening sort of real time. Um, so we wanna overcome a lot of these limitations. Uh, and then the main disadvantages to allogeneic cell therapies are really this risk of GVHD for some of them, especially if they're T cell related and, and potential alloimmunization, poor in vivo persistence due to rapid rejection are the two uh, main ones that, that we talk about a lot. And in this slide, uh, what I'm showing here is a list of the barriers to allogeneic cell therapies that currently uh, exist in my mind, being source material, right? So we just talked a lot about cord blood and I'll talk more about that obviously, but finding healthy donors can be harder than you might imagine given what kind of criteria uh, is put in place for an eligible donor and iPSCs are pretty hard to generate. Um, donor variability, we know that for every donor and in cell therapies, we can often see really good uh, product, uh, final product from a donor or maybe not so good. And so there's a lot of donor to donor variability, scalability, uh, cost of goods, the ability to cryopreserve and in vivo persistence are all the other uh, potential barriers that we have in this space. So how are we working to overcome this? So we see cord blood as uh, one of the best starting sources of material because we really do overcome the limitations of source material. As Marcy already talked about, cord blood is highly, highly regulated. So for a cord blood or so a, a cell therapy developer like me, this is wonderful to be able to go to a bank and get a drug that's already fully qualified as my starting material. And we know that the storage of cord blood units has been validated. And I guess now it's there was a publication of 27 years, I think it was, um, or maybe 30. So we know that these cells uh, can be maintained in storage until we need them. And then finally, for the other barriers that I listed there, we believe that doing a pooled donor manufacturing approach can significantly reduce and overcome these barriers. So we see this as a way to reduce donor to donor variability. We see it as a way to overcome a lot of logistics and cost of goods. So we have a you know, highly scalable, very consistent, a uh, lot to lot manufacturing approach in these cells, which I'll talk to you about our approach. We are generating true off the shelf cryopreserved treatments. 
And the other thing is that these are non-clonal, meaning they are not from a single donor or from a single iPSC. And we believe this will uh, help us in, in the in vivo persistence um, uh, barrier. Okay, so this, I'm gonna to talk to you now, I'm gonna switch gears and talk specifically about what we're doing and the platform that we have developed. Uh, and many of you have heard me talk about this um, throughout my career. So I, we utilize here notch signaling and notch signaling was originally uh, identified by Irv Bernstein. He was one of the seminal um, uh, researchers who identified notch signaling as a uh, signal to tell a stem cell to self-renew. So this figure is meant to be a depiction of what happens in the bone marrow microenvironment, where we know that osteoblasts, that line, that microenvironment, express notch ligands. These, and we know that hematopoietic stem cells, CD34 hematopoietic stem cells, express notch receptors. And it is that interaction between the notch ligand and the notch receptor that activates that notch signaling and tells that stem cell to self-renew. Uh, but importantly, our research also showed that if we could vary the quantity of notch signaling that that receiving cell sees, it either self-renews or it is released to differentiate. And we know that the quantity, lower quantities of notch signaling uh, tends to go towards myeloid, whereas the higher quantities go towards lymphoid. So we really have manipulated this and, and leveraged this knowledge to make an ex vivo approach. Um, and this is our notch platform. And so what I'm showing you here on the left, uh, we have proprietary engineered ligands that we adhere to the tissue culture surface trying to make that surface like a bone marrow microenvironment. We can isolate stem cells, in this case, cord blood derived CD34 positive stem and progenitor cells, and again, replicate what's happening in the bone marrow microenvironment. And this allows us to generate multiple cell types while first leveraging the expansion part of this before we differentiate. So this slide just shows you where we are with things. Um, we will be talking only about the top three here, the HSPCs, the natural killer cells and monocytes. And I'm gonna very briefly touch on all of these. We can't really go into too much depth here, uh, but you can see that we have products that are in various stages of development from late stage all the way down to discovery. And our hope is to be able to generate multiple different cellular therapies that we can sort of use in concert to mimic um, the immune system to fight disease. Okay, so here's our standardized approach to, and this is very standardized, we've been doing it for a long time. And on the left here, I'm showing you the standardized universal expansion process that we use. And you'll see this repeated throughout the presentation. We start with pooled cord blood donors um, that are all eligible and we do not look at HLA matching at all. What we look at is the content uh, or the, the CD34 content. We isolate those CD34 cells and then leverage our um, stem cell expansion. When we stop there, that's our first product, Dilanubicel. And I, I will just make a plug here that this product has now received FDA RMAT orphan drug and fast track designation for first line therapy for AML. So we're very excited about further development of this product. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then, it, so we can stop here, or we can then go on to differentiate these cells. And I'm gonna tell you about our work in um, the NK cells and myeloid cells, and primarily our work on engineering those cells. Um, and then finally, we've standardized the, the back end process as well. So all of our products go through a fill and finish. There are about 20 cc's of a product that is a bedside thaw and infuse. And we've now done this both with Dylan Ubicel and with unmodified NK cells. Uh, and then again, our phase one trials, I won't talk about, those have been out licensed to Coleptus Therapeutics. Okay, so again, you'll see this common theme. We have a phase one where we leverage stem cell expansion and potentially then uh, do some priming for the next phase of the immune effector cells. We have three product lines that I'll talk to you about, Dilanubicel. Um, and again, this is a product that has been in the stem cell transplant arena. We are not developing it for cord blood transplant any longer, but we are developing it for AML. So we have extensive data on the safety of this approach, including both single donor derived product as well as our pool donor derived product. And it is this population of cells that then go on to be differentiated into either uh, NK cells or uh, monocytes or macrophages. So in AML, very briefly, again, there's too much to really go over in, in full depth, but I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, but we know that in, in acute myeloid leukemia, there are many deficiencies of current therapy, and that is demonstrated by the fact that the overall survival still today is less than 30% at five years. 
It is a very complicated disease to take care of because there are many, many complex genetic uh, mutations that happen in, in AML, many subgroups. So you can't pick one target like CD19 and get all of AML. So it's a very difficult disease to target. These patients are often very sick when they present and they're older and they're very vulnerable to treatment uh, and complex side effects. So we are searching for therapies that can be effective, accessible, and safe. And so hopefully I'm gonna show you a little bit about that with Dylan Uvisel. So this is a first-in-class cell-based off-the-shelf adjuvant treatment for de novo AML patients. So it does not replace chemotherapy, but is given as an adjuvant to that uh, upfront induction and consolidation. And again, you can see here, we uh, make our product in the ways that I had discussed previously. So this is a ready to infuse on-demand product uh, that is given at 15 to 20 minutes or at the bedside, either inpatient or outpatient. This product has been developed as a non-engrafting, so this is not a transplant. So this is a pooled donor, non-engrafting, non-HLA matched cell therapy uh, that is thought to induce potent graft versus leukemia and autologous graft versus leukemia effect and overcome the immune escape mechanisms of AML cells. And again, um, I can't go into all the details about the MOA, but there's a lot of uh, data in the literature to suggest that this is possible and some excellent work by Rob Wynn uh, over in the UK doing something similar, but with neutrophils in the setting of cord blood transplant. But this is the take home slide from the global trial that we have already run. And this was a trial that looked at newly diagnosed AML patients receiving their first therapies, first two rounds of therapy. And what you can see here is that in a randomized fashion, the standard of care who received the chemotherapy alone had a CR rate of 40%, whereas any of the arms of the Dilanubicel uh, tract, which received chemotherapy plus Dilanubicel, you can see an improvement in the CR rate up to 78% in our target dose. This was also very safe. We performed 184 infusions in 101 patients, and there was no GVHG, no need for immune suppression, and no increase in alloimmunization. So this was pretty exciting for us. We also believe that this is very clinically accessible, which was uh, incredibly important, right? So this is off the shelf as, we, as we've discussed. It is very scalable because we can just increase the number of starting cord blood units for input so we can get better output. Um, and then again, we're working with our um, public cord blood banking partners on this and it's universal. So it is a no HLA matching, no target screening, and then therefore very easily adapted into physician directed uh, evolving first line of care. Okay, so let's transition to our NK cell program. And again, you will see again, a very common theme here. In this case, we leverage our stem cell and progenitor cell expansion and do a little bit of priming here to prepare the cells for their lymphoid differentiation. Uh, what's important is that because of our expansion phase, we generate our own APC type cells. So we do not require any kind of feeder cells when we make our NK cells. And that's a huge advantage for us. We are also animal component free. And I'm just showing you little bits of data here uh, to show you that indeed we do make very potent uh, NK cells that are capable of killing AML cells, target cells, serially. So we can put these NK cells in, in with AML cells and then challenge them again repeatedly over a number of days uh, without adding new NK cells, but adding new targets and we see repeat killing uh, by the same NK cell population. We can also cryopreserve and maintain post-thaw uh, viability and cell recovery, which is clearly absolutely critical to use of these off-the-shelf products. This slide shows you that with unmodified NK cells, which are highly potent against AML in vitro, that indeed in vivo, when we looked at three different uh, AML tumor cell lines in a mouse model, we saw control of that tumor using our unmodified uh, NK cells. And then we can also then take this a step further, again, because we have a two-step process, we can think about early gene delivery using retrovirus or lentivirus, and we have now uh, generated a lot of in vitro and in vivo proof of concept data that indeed, if we engineer the cells early, they then go on to continue to express those, um, those cars or whatever it is we're putting into that cell, even at the end. We can also look at non-viral mediated forms of gene delivery and do that later in the process. So we're working on, on all of these approaches right now. This is a, just a proof of concept. We are, uh, for clarity, we are not gonna be doing CD19 uh, CAR and K cells, but this is the virus that we had to work with. 
And we wanted to show in our earlier work that indeed when we made CAR NKs against CD19, we could again control tumor and, and improve survival. So this is just showing you mice who received cryomedia alone versus mice who received either eight doses or five doses of our CAR NK. And indeed we showed uh, tumor control. We're working with Coeptis Therapeutics uh, using this cell generation platform in combination with their universal CAR platform. So this is a really beautiful uh, platform in which we hope to derive a universal CAR in a universal cell so that we can really, if you think about it, we can generate a bank of CAR, universal CAR and K cells that could be used uh, against multiple indications in multiple patients all via the use of tagged anti-tumor antibodies. So what I'm showing you here is that the CAR itself is universal. It works uh, and is targeted to the tumor cell via these tagged antibodies. So this is work that's ongoing with Coeptis using our platform and their universal CAR technology. And I'm showing you here that the patient, this is the idea that the patient can present with cancer. We have a universal SNAP CAR effector cell infusion that's sitting in a freezer and can be combined with selected uh, anti-tumor antibodies to address whatever malignancy that patient has. And then finally, I'll briefly just talk about our myeloid cell program. I know this is a lot, uh, but again, what you're gonna see here, similar idea. We start from a stem and progenitor cell expansion phase one, we can then differentiate into monocytes and then finally macrophages uh, if we choose to do so or whether we'll go with our monocytes, that remains a little bit uh, to be determined. So we've optimized this process. And here I'm just showing you on the far left that we have a CD34, a very purified population of CD34 that we start with. But by the end of that phase three, we are uh, now generating very nice macrophages in culture. Um, this is looking at the kinetics of that growth. So again, this top left graph is showing you the reduction of CD34 as we expect because we were differentiating towards the monocytes and macrophages. Uh, and we get tremendous, we really leverage that stem cell expansion. So we get tremendous expansion from CD34 positive cells. And these, uh, this little blue box here on your right is really talking about what we believe will be the dosing opportunities uh, based on some of the literature and doses that are being used currently. So we think this is a way to overcome the limitations of starting from autologous monocytes, which really do not grow uh, or expand much in vitro. And again, uh, we can thaw, we can do a post-thaw, we can cryopreserve and then post-thaw and maintain recovery and viability of these cells, critical to moving forward. And then this is just some functional data to end with. So these are our monocytes. This is showing you phagocytosis. So the graph on the left, uh, what you wanna see, the higher the number, the better phagocytosis there is. So the black line is a non-phagocytic AML cell line. So we wouldn't expect to see any phagocytosis, uh, but then the other, the THP ones are capable of this, as well as our differentiated monocytes and macrophages. And on the right, you can see that when these cells phagocytose, you can see this red, this change to this red dye. So this was good functional data for us to have on our generated uh, monocytes and macrophages. Um, and then we are doing, we are again utilizing this platform to try to engineer these cells as well, uh, in particular towards using them for solid tumor applications. But as proof of concept, we again used our lentiviral uh, CD19 CAR and showed here that we can control tumor growth. This is a little bit different than the last slide I just showed. So the higher the, the number here means more tumor growth. So the red cells were just the CD19 positive target cells alone. And then the bluish lines are one showing you that both in the monocytes on the left and in the macrophages on the right, we can control uh, tumor growth. So this is um, all very exciting to us, and um, we're, we're tremendously excited to, to partner with our cord blood banking partners, as well as anyone else out there who wants to partner with us on this work. Um, and I just want to acknowledge both the folks at Coeptis and Vera and the amazing team I work with and my amazing partners in research. And of course, like Marcy, uh, we always have to acknowledge the patients who have really helped us get where we are, uh, the cord blood donors and um, our funding. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Joanne, who is going to talk to us about treating neurologic conditions with cord blood derived therapies. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. And again, we'll hold questions till the end. 
Um, I'm going to talk today about treating neurologic conditions in children with cord blood and cord tissue derived therapies. These are my disclosures. Um, I want to start by just telling you that I work in a program called uh, MC3, which stands for the Marcus Center for Cellular Cures, which is, um, we envision like a small biotech in an academic center, which is Duke Health. Um, biotech in an academic center is somewhat of an oxymoron, but what we do do is we have everything from discovery to clinical trials to actual GMP manufacturing commercially within our center. Um, so we have the Carolinas Cord Blood Bank, which is an FDA licensed public cord blood bank, which uh, provides a lot of the GMP compliance source material for the cells we manufacture. We have a discovery um, laboratory called Chesterfield, where we do a lot of discovery work and also development of potency assays, characterization of different products and work that we use for submission of INDs. We have a process development lab where we can bring promising uh, things from the laboratory into GMP, and then a full GMP um, clean room manufacturing lab where um, we both manufacture products under IND and clinical trials, and a product called Rethymic, uh, which is thymic tissue for reimplantation in um, babies with the George anomaly, and that is done as a contract manufacturer for a company called Enzivan. Finally, we conduct our own phase one and two and occasionally phase three clinical trials. We have a data and um, clinical trials group who oversees that. And all of this is underpinned by um, a robust regulatory and quality group. We manufacture three main cells um, from cord blood uh, it's the monocytes, which we believe are the active cell in some of the work I'm going to show you. Um, we also manufacture a monocyte-derived cell we call DUOC, uh, which is capable of um, remyelinating brain in experimental systems. And I'll show you we have that in the clinical trials and a few diseases. And we manufacture human cord tissue, MSCs, from donated cord tissue from donors to our bank. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. I'm not gonna go through all this, but you can see that over the past almost 10 years now, we've done a series of phase one and two clinical trials um, in children with brain injury, um, which includes cerebral palsy, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, autism specter disease, and then adults with stroke, um, children with leukodystrophies, and adults with primary progressive MS. And you can see the dip by the different color charting here, whether they were autologous or allogeneic studies, and whether they used cord tissue MSCs or the DUOC cells. Uh, going way back to the beginning, I can't help but acknowledge um, the people who started all of this. First, Hal Broxmeyer, who really back in the mid 80s um, had the idea and proved that cord blood contains blood stem cells and that they could replace bone marrow in a traditional bone marrow transplant, which today we call a hematopoietic cell transplant. Um, this was demonstrated in a little boy named Matthew in 1988 by Elian Gluckman, who transplanted him with his baby sister's HLA matched cord blood um, and showed that his bone marrow could be reconstituted successfully. Matthew's now more than 35 years post-transplant, shown in the third picture. And really, this was proof of principle. Cord blood contained blood stem cells and really paved the way for the rest of the field of using cord blood as a source of donor cells in the hematopoietic cell transplant. And if you fast forward to today, there have been more than 50,000 uh, cord blood transplants used in the setting of rescuing bone marrow from myeloablative therapy or diseases. Now, in my work as a pediatric transplanter, one of the kinds of diseases that we transplant are children with leukodystrophies. So these are genetic inherited diseases 
that are generally due to a mutation in a gene that causes an enzyme deficiency in an enzyme that's necessary for development of the brain. So shown in this picture or, or slide is examples of two girls with Crabbe disease. Crabbe disease, also known as globoid leukodystrophy, is a rare inherited leukodystrophy that in its infantile form causes um, babies to um, basically not go through normal development and to die at one to two years of age. Uh, the enzyme deficiency is called galactocerebrosidase, or GALC for short. When you don't have that enzyme, you can't properly uh, myelinate neurons. Um, the two girls in this picture both had cord blood transplants in their first month of life. And in their case, they were identified because the family had had another child born with the disease who was diagnosed after presenting with symptoms when it's too late for treatment. The girl on the left uh, had a transplant with cord blood at 19, unrelated donor cord blood at 19 days of age after myeloablative chemotherapy. The girl on the right had a cord blood transplant at 21 days of age, again, after myeloablative chemotherapy. And they both um, are surviving today. The girl on the right is very functional. She's in college. She can drive. She, if you met her on the street, I don't know if you'd recognize she had any disability. And the girl on the right, you can see, walks with a walker um, and has what we call peripheral neuropathy, which is part of the disease. Now, interestingly, in the pictures in the center, uh, which were taken by Maria Escalar when she was working at UNC, um, you can see the corticospinal tracts of these two girls when each was two days of age. And the tract on the left is normal. The tract on the right is already compromised. It's skinnier and doesn't have as much yellow, which is myelin, which is limited in newborns, but should be starting. And because of that, the girl on the right, um, even if we could have transplanted her you know, at one days of age, which is impossible, um, has more of a disability. Um, to address this, we developed therapy we call DUOC, which is a cord blood derived cellular therapy, which we've shown in experimental systems is capable of remyelinating the brain. Now we first got the idea to do this because of the slide in the upper left, which um, shows you a section of brain from a child with Crabbe disease who had symptoms at the time of transplant and who died unfortunately 10 months later. Her parents let us study her brain and we were able to show engraftment of donor cells uh, in many areas of the brain. So this is XY fish on a DAPI stain. And uh, this was a little girl. Her donor was a boy, cord blood. And anywhere you see a green dot is a donor cell. When we looked more carefully at what these cells were, they looked um, mostly like microglial cells. And we spent about eight years isolating a similar cell from cord blood, which you now see with time-lapse photography swimming around on the bottom left slide. Um, this is Duoc and it is um, a microglial-like cell that grows as a macrophage monocyte, similar to what you heard Colleen talking about. Um, over 21 days in culture from cryopreserved cord blood. We were able to show that this cell in the middle panel is capable of a remyelinating brain in a mouse model called the Cooper zone model, uh, where you feed the mouse Cooper zone, they demyelinate the corpus callosum, you can inject DUOC cells in the bottom and then see remyelination a week later. And on the left, you can see through EM that the, um, morphology of the myelin is normal. The top panels are the control, which were sham treated animals. Um, Tony Filiano, who works in our lab, is also shown in a mouse model of experimental autoimmune encephalitis that um, the duoc cells, when injected intrathecally at the beginning of symptoms, um, can um, attenuate the development of symptoms and paralysis in the, that mouse model. And because of that, we have duoc in clinical trials, both in children with leukodystrophy, where we're giving it as a intrathecal therapy a month or two post-transplant with the hope that we will accelerate 
my, um, myelin, myelination of the brain and getting donor cells to the brain. Um, this study is ongoing. Um, we've shown that it's safe, but we really can't address efficacy because the children on this study also get a standard cord blood transplant. Um, we treated 34 patients um, and under IND, and we did make one modification to the IND, which was to add hydrocortisone to the formulation when we switched to using two cord bloods instead of one for the therapy. So in this case, the baby gets one cord blood for the hematopoietic stem cell transplant and a second cord blood uh, for the DUOC manufacturing. For this reason, and to continue to evaluate higher doses and also uh, early signs of efficacy, we opened a 20 patient phase 1A dose escalation clinical trial in adults with primary progressive multiple sclerosis back in 2022. And um, we've escalated the dose to 50 million cells as a single dose intrathecally. Um, these patients don't get any other adjuvant therapy uh, as part of this protocol. We've treated 14 patients to date and are continuing um, to enroll. Um, we haven't seen any safety issues, but the studies of efficacy are pending. Now, I always like to say that cord blood is not a bag of stem cells, and it's not. Uh, it's a bag of many kinds of cells um, that all have, I think, potential for therapeutic applications. Um, the blood stem cell, which is a very small portion of the cells in cord blood at the top of this cartoon, is the cell responsible for uh, conferring a hematopoietic engraftment after myeloablative therapy. Uh, the cells over on the right are lymphoid cells of varying maturation stages. And as Colleen was talking, I really believe these cells may ultimately become sources for allogeneic immune effector cell therapies. Um, and then we are focusing on the monocytes circled on the bottom um, as either freshly derived therapy, meaning they come from cord blood, they're infused as a cord blood unit without other manipulation, or grown in culture like I just showed you with the duox cells. Um, now talking about the cord blood monocytes, we've been able to show in tissue slice models that cord blood monocytes can rescue tissue from hypoxic injury in vitro. And this is called an OGD model um, where you can asphyxiate tissue and also deprive it of glucose. And then in the middle slide here show destruction of cells and a astrocytosis. But when you co-culture cells in this model with cord blood monocytes, um, you see um, preservation of the neurons, no astrocytosis and no cell death. Um, this is published so you can look it up, but basically the graphs on the bottom show you that this is a property of whole cord blood, of the CD14 cells in cord blood, but not of CD14 cells in adult blood. So there's something unique about um, cord blood monocytes that allows them to offer neuroprotection after hypoxic injury. That led us to study cerebral palsy, um, hoping that we could give an infusion of cord blood cells without chemotherapy. So not a transplant, just infusing the cells so they could act like a drug. Um, two children with cerebral palsy to see if there would be effects, effects in vivo that would improve motor function. And when you study children, there are always problems you have to take into account that children grow and develop. And even when they have a brain injury, they still grow and develop. And if you're testing an intervention, you have to make sure that you adequately interpret the um, effect and don't give credit to normal development as a, as a sign of uh, effect of your therapy. So we use a scale called the GM-FCS classification, which has been validated for uh, showing natural history of motor development in children with cerebral palsy. And it is classified by a uh, level with level one being very mild effects and level five being very severe effects. Um, so in CP, I'm showing you some of the curves that predict over the first seven, eight years of life, what a child with 
say level one, which is mild disease versus level five, will gain on their scale, which is called the DMFM 66 scale, where a physical therapist assesses 66 functions that the child can or cannot do and then grades them based on that scale. And what you can see is that a child who has mild disease and is young is gonna develop a lot of points, gain a lot of function, even though they have a disability. And a child who has more disability or is older will naturally gain less function over time. And we use this to uh, establish a baseline for expected changes that we could compare to, to see the effect of cord blood. Um, we first performed a safety study, um, which showed that infusion of the child's own cord blood was safe in the clinical outpatient setting, and then did a study with uh, 63 children who had qualified autologous cord blood that was a randomized placebo-controlled trial. This study is also published. Uh, eligibility allowed children ages one to six years with uh, GMCS, F GMFCS levels of two to four, so not the most severely affected kids or level one kids that had what's called an affected hand and could use that hand as an assist only. They couldn't have other comorbidities or evidence of genetic diseases, and they had to have a qualified autologous cord blood unit. And I will tell you, we screened over 1,500 kids to find 63 who met the clinical criteria with their cerebral palsy and had a qualified autologous family bank cord blood unit. We allowed, oops, a cell dose of um, 10 to 50, to 50 million cells. They had to have a viability study on the pre cryo cord blood of 80% or more. They had to have sterility cultures performed and negative. The mom had to have donor screening with infectious disease markers. And we confirmed identity with um, HLA typing on the kid and their cord blood. So essentially we evaluated the kids, we brought them to Duke and they, after informed consent, were randomized to two schedules of infusion. Kids in arm A or one got their cord blood infusion at baseline and 12 months later, a placebo infusion. And the kids in the second arm got a placebo infusion followed by a cord blood infusion 12 months later and everyone was evaluated at 24 months. Um, the placebo was um, TC199, which is kind of a pink liquid with 1% DMSO and it was covered so that um, uh, you couldn't see what the child was getting. The take home message from this study was that in the um, overall groups, blue being um, placebo and red being cord blood, there was not a difference in the one year gain in motor function between the cord blood arm and the placebo arm. But when we broke it down by cell dose using an infused dose of 20 million cells per kilo, which is equivalent to a pre cryo dose of about 25 million cells per kilo, in the green bars, you can see that we saw a statistically significant improvement in motor function in the ch children treated with cord blood at a year. And Alan Song, who is a research neuroradiologist at our group um, and who studies whole brain connectivity, performed whole brain connectivity MRI studies in these kids. And this slide just shows you what it looks like if a child has CP in their motor tracks on this kind of analysis. So healthy kids in the lower right in the bluish, greenish, purple color have normal tracks on both sides of the brain. Children with diplegia in the upper right have an abnormality um, also on both sides of the brain. Children with hemiplegia on the lower left have an abnormality on the left, in this kid on the left side of the brain. And children um, with quadriplegia have really reduced motor tracks on both sides of the brain. So we use this technology to look at the children on our study um, where MRI analysis could be performed. Um, on the left, you see the composite results of all children and a red line or a turquoise node is a sign of improvement at a p-value of uh, less than 0.005. Um, and in the composite, you can see that the kids, some of the kids had improvement in the turgor size and intensity of their motor tracks 
On the right, you can see that that correlated with the kids in the blue dots who got the higher cell doses with a p-value of 0.02. So we believe that the monocytes are stimulating oligodendrocytes in the brain to proliferate and remyelinate. Um, and that results in improvement in the motor tracts in these kids. We then went on to test um, the safety of this approach using a higher dose of cord blood cells. And to do that, we elected to use allogeneic publicly banked cord blood, where we could easily get to a cell dose of 100 million cells per kilo. And although I'm not showing you this in prior to doing these studies, we showed that infusion of unmatched uh, cord blood in adults with stroke was safe. And we showed that infusion of allogeneic cord blood in children with autism was safe. And these units were partially matched at a four of six level or greater. And the cell dose was 100 million cells per kilo. In addition, in the study, we compared cord blood to cord tissue MSCs that we manufactured from third party cord tissue also donated to our bank. In this study, we studied kids two to four years of age with a GMCSF level of one to four, GMFCS level of one to four, um, who had CP related to HIE, PVL, which is periventricular leukomalacia, which incurs in premature babies, or babies that had a stroke or bleed in utero or shortly after birth. And the randomization was similar to what I showed you in the other study, except this was open label. So we had a group of children who got a single dose of allogeneic cord blood, and then um, were evaluated a year later, um, or children, sorry, this is going without me, <laughs> um, who got three doses of cord tissue MSCs at baseline, three months and six months, and evaluated at 12 months, or a natural history group that got no infusion at the beginning and at 12 months got a cord blood infusion, but were not evaluated other than for safety after that infusion. Um, and in this study, we were able to show that on the right, the cord tissue cells did not, did not produce a statistically significant improvement in motor function in the children with CP, but the cord blood cells did produce, again, and this reproduced our prior data, a statistically significant change in motor function in these children. We were interested in knowing if we went to an even higher dose, would it make a difference? We didn't exactly answer that question because the level of change is the same as what we saw in the children who got doses of 20 million cells per kilo infused on prior studies. We then did a meta-analysis to look at um, by GM C, uh, CSF or FCS level, um, if there were differences in response um, in children at various levels. And we were able to see that the children with mild to moderate disease, which is levels one to three, were responsible for the major effect that we were seeing from cord blood, again, with a highly um, sensitive p-value. So we are now moving forward with a phase three multi-center registration trial, which will be a randomized placebo-controlled trial of allogeneic publicly banked cord blood in 208 children with CP due to the same incidences I mentioned before, ages two to five years. Um, we are enrolling children with GMFCS levels of one to three, and they will receive allogeneic unrelated donor cord blood at a dose of 50 to 100 million cells per kilo. And the cord blood has to be matched at at least four of six HLA uh, antigens. Um, the endpoint again will be the GMFCS level change on the GMFM66 score. There will be other secondary tests and per recommendations from uh, FDA, we've applied for RMAT um, and hope to hear next month if that was accepted. Um, and we think that if this phase three trial is positive, FDA could add cerebral palsy to one of the clinical indications for use of unrelated donor publicly banked cord blood 
under existing BLAs. So back to Marcy's talk, I mean, this would be a reason why we'd have to consider whether there's increased demand and we need increased supply. Just to end with two other slides to tantalize you, we did and published the results of a phase two randomized placebo controlled trial of infusion of allogeneic cord blood cells in adults with acute ischemic stroke. These adults got infused uh, days three to 10 post-stroke. And this was a multi-center trial with involvement of many of the public cord blood banks and who also had nearby stroke centers that could participate. Uh, because of COVID, we did not accrue all the patients we intended, but we did analyze data and we did see a trend toward, and this is in the lower left, better functional outcomes at three months in the patients who received cord blood. This is a trend, not a statistically significant result, but we hope to be able to get funding to repeat another similar trial. And finally, we've tested cord tissue MSCs that we have um, grown from the umbilical cord of donors to our public bank after informed consent, where we take the tissue into the GMP clean room lab, we digest the tissue, we grow it to P0, P1, and P2, and characterize the P2 cryopreserved product, and then have taken that into several different clinical trials. This shows you the results of a recent report that we did in newborns with HIE, where um, we gave one or two doses of uh, these cord tissue MSCs um, between the first two days of life and then a second dose between uh, the, by the second month of life. Um, this is very early, but all these babies did well, uh, were discharged early, had normal MRIs at I believe nine days of age and normal development at a year of age. So again, we hope to move this forward um, into phase two in a multi-center study because this is a disease with terrible outcomes and anything that can be done to improve outcomes will be um, a welcome innovation. Uh, in that study, um, again, in Tony's lab, um, um, we developed um, an in vitro assay using brain slices to allow us to show that these um, MSCs and also CD14 monocytes inhibit micro glial activation. And we've standardized this assay and hope to use it as a potency assay for some of the studies we're doing with the monocytes as, or, and the MSCs as we move forward. So in conclusion, we've shown that both autologous and allogeneic cord blood cells have excellent safety profiles when infused without chemotherapy. Um, and suggestion of efficacy in phase one and two clinical trials in children with brain injury. In children with CP, the cord blood monocytes appear to be the active cell, and we need to do additional phase three well-designed studies to prove our observation. Um, we know that cord tissue MSCs mon modulate neuroinflammation. I didn't show you data for our testing in children with autism, um, but we do um, have evidence that they are safe and may, um, at least at the phase two level, help some of the symptoms associated with those diseases. Personally, I believe we need to use allogeneic cell sources for a lot of these kids because many of them don't have their own cord blood banked. Um, allogeneic might be publicly banked or sibling cord blood, um, but many of these babies who are preemies or have birth asphyxia or some tragedy at birth really can't have their own cord blood connect, uh, collected. So I kind of said how we're moving forward, but quickly we're finishing a cord tissue MSC trial in children with autism. We plan the phase three multi-center registration trial in children with CP with cord blood from public banks. Um, for HIE, we're hoping to move into a phase two study with cord tissue MSCs. And for DUOC, we'll wait to see the results of our trial in the adults with MS. But if we see hints of efficacy, we'll move on to phase two. And again, I want to thank our team, probably small print, so you can't see everybody's name, but there really are hundreds of people that have been involved in generating these results and doing these works. 
this work, caring for these patients over the years that this has evolved. Um, it really takes a village to do this kind of work. So I am gonna turn things over to Colleen uh, for the Q&A and I think there are a fair number of questions in the chat. Yep, thank you so much, Joanne and Marcy for your great presentations. Um, if anyone, we have about 15 minutes maybe. So if anyone has a burning question that they haven't put in the chat, please please do so or in the Q&A. But there are a couple so that we can start with those. Um, I'm gonna ask, well, maybe Marcy, you first, since Joanne just was talking, give her a bit of a breather. Uh, there's a question that is, what is the best methodology or technology to store processed stem cells from cord blood, considering both for clinical and for research use? But it's a really good question. I think we don't I, I think we don't really know the answer to that quite yet. I'll say what we've done so far, right, is um, a red blood cell reduction and a density centrifugation, right, to isolate the total nucleated cells. And then we freeze them with DMSO. And that is that methodology that you talked about that has been proven by Hal Broxmeyer's lab and his group to be able to be frozen for a long time. Um, what I will say is we don't really know what might be a better method for some of the new technologies that come out. I think that still remains to be seen. I think for banks uh, right now, I think we're going to still be stick with this um, technology for now, and then we're going to have to see what happens with new um, applications. I don't know, Joanne, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, let me think about look at, look at a couple other ones. Um, there's another one on cord blood. It says with one cord blood expansion technology approved, do we think this in will increase the use of transplantable cord blood? Are there other promising candidates in the works? And I'm sure all of us have something to say about that. Um, I will start by saying, I mean, I think undoubtedly cord blood transplant does and will always have a place in the in the stem cell transplant arena. Um, I think it, it's going to be more and more important as we evolve, um, you know, and our, our country is getting more and more genetically diverse so that it's going to be harder and harder for people to find donors unless we continue to collect cord blood today, right? So, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons to continue to collect cord blood. I think the bigger thing is, as you're alluding to, is making sure that we maintain excellence and expertise in core blood um, and core blood transplantation. And I think that's really where, you know, the CBA, the core blood transplant network, um, the CBAG, which is the core blood advisory group to the NODP, these, all of these groups are going to be vital in really trying to make sure that this stays alive. It is not, you know, this is not a cookbook kind of thing. This is really something where people need to have experience. In terms of the expansion, um, and do I think that will uh, increase the use of transplantable blood and, and or transplantable cord blood and other promising expansion candidates? There are other groups for sure who are working on cord blood expansion. Um, you know, so there's XL there and and there's Celaid in Japan, and I think there was another new group that was working on this. Some are working um, on methods not around time to engraft it. I think that's important to recognize that a lot of these expansion, te expansion technologies are trying to, to do things like decrease graft versus host disease or decrease the risk of relapse. Um, and our product, Dilanubicel, is actually being utilized. So we're a little bit different, we're cord blood expansion, but we're being really utilized as adjuvants to primary stem cell sources. Um, but we do believe that our product could potentially be used to reduce the risk of relapse in high-risk patients who are getting a cord blood transplant. Dr. Milano, Filippo Milano at the Fred Hutch is running an investigator-initiated trial doing just that using Dilanubicel Del and cord blood transplant. Um, but I do think this is an exciting time. Joanne, Marcy, other thoughts around cord blood expansion, other candidates in the work, in the works? Yeah, so first, I just want to mention, I think, um, we haven't given cord blood banks the credit they deserve for being the first regulated um, blood stem cell source. Um, you may or may not know, but um, bone marrow and mobilized blood are not regulated in the same way that cord blood is. And that's both made it more challenging, but also in some ways better because you really can get GMP grade source material from cord blood banks which can be sources of cells as you've seen or tissue for um, 
manufacturing of other products. Um, as far as expansion goes, I think that when you have a patient, so so for Omnisurge, which is Gamita Cell's product and with, for which they deserve huge credit for working probably two decades to really get it FDA approved. And it's the first FDA approved product for cord blood expansion. Um, engraftment can occur in seven to 11 days, which is in contrast to two and a half to four weeks with an unmanipulated cord blood unit. But the engraftment of cord blood units in terms of time to engraftment has diminished from the very, very early days where everybody kind of remembers it took a really long time. And I think in all the banks I'm aware of, the median time to engraft in is now 19 or 20 days, um, which is really shorter than somebody using post-transplant psi with a bone marrow dome. Um, I think though that expansion with the gameta cell product is very valuable for patients who have diseases where prolonged neutropenia will cause increased morbidity. Um, and um, that's kind of where I think it will be applied currently. I think expansion like Colleen is doing, or if we could expand our monocytes and divide, derive products that could be dosed multiple times to, in my case, children with brain injury, would be an advance of the field. And I think this is gonna come, um, maybe not from the companies expanding the hematopoietic stem cells, but, but uh, with these other kinds of um, specialized cells that we all know can be manufactured from cord blood. So I, I forget who said it, maybe Marcy, but I think we're at the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's gonna be developed um, in the next five or 10 years. Excellent. Um, Marcy, any, your, any other thoughts? No, I think, you, I think you've covered it. I think the yeah. banks um, have done a good job of being able to actually, um, I know um, many of the banks work with different developers to be able to support them in this. And I think that what we need to also think about is the fact that if uh, that utilization does increase, we need to be able to meet that demand. And I think the banks have, um, at least thought about it, and we'll be able to do that as, as the need arises. Right now, we don't have a demand problem. You know, we have lots of donors um, and lots of units and in inventory, but um, we hope to have that problem someday in the future, right? Well, and I guess as a developer, I think that's excellent to hear, right, that it's really just a matter of, you know, because I do worry, like, what happens if one thing hits, right, and it wipes out the inventory, but I, I think, you know, the fact that you can sort of turn up the spigot, so to speak, right, and and collect more as necessary and working with your developers, that's that's really important. Um, I think someone asked about, you know, storing stem cells. I can't remember the, the question that we just addressed before. Again, as a developer, you know, it might be nice too to be able to get isolated stem cells that are from, from the banks versus the whole cord blood unit, right? And is there a way to think about, you know, as Joanne said, it's not just a bag of stem cells, but can you take a bag of cord blood, divide it into the various fractions, freeze those and, and give those, right? Or the, would those be validated products? So I think there's there's so much that we need to do um, to continue to facilitate uh, the development. Um, okay, I wanna make sure what time is it? We have five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, yeah. Okay, there is, um, there's a question about uh, what are the next steps and timelines, I think, from my presentation? And I'll just very briefly say that, you know, our our, our hope is to really push Dilanubicel to the next, you know, hopefully final trial before FDA approval. Uh, we're, we were super excited to get the RMAT designation, um, fast track and ODD, because this gives us more interaction with the FDA, which we so um, are so looking forward to, to really develop the final trial. Uh, and looking, we're looking for partners for, for that approach. So that's our immediate near-term clinical goal. Uh, and then the other, you know, our NK cell product and our myeloid product, we are still mostly in the IND, sort of pre-IND, IND enabling type phases. Uh, but the hope is to have products off of those cell lines too, or those um, programs too within the next about, you know, one to two years. So. So that's where we are. And again, you know, happy to talk to anyone offline. Um, that, okay, okay. And there's one sure. question that just came in, yeah. mm -hmm. which is, um, what do you think is the biggest barrier to cord blood collection? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, and um, then it goes on to say, 
lack of available public option, cost of private banking, acceptance criteria at banks, lack of approved uses outside of transplant, what? So I just wanna say, I think the biggest barrier is collection and getting OBs and midwives to buy into doing a high quality, high volume collection. They have a lot on their mind and a lot of other things going on, um, but without big, sterile, um, you know, donor screening negative units, you know, cord blood units are very hard to use. So I think we need to be um, encouraging our OB and midwife colleagues to focus more on increasing uh, the, I'll say the quality and the size of collected cord blood units. Yeah, yeah totally I agree, agree Joanne. Yeah. But I, I think that there is probably a little bit also to that on um, the usage, right? Because it's pretty tough it's a tough environment right now because there are so many collected that actually don't get utilized. So we, at, I think all of us as an industry have to um, consider thinking about making sure that we're messaging to the donors and the OBGYNs and the midwives about how important the research units are too, right? Because if, just because it doesn't get used for transplant doesn't actually mean that it's not useful, right? All of those research units that we send, um, are for developers that are making new products and new uses. So I think that's part of, probably part of the conversation that I think doesn't get all the way down to the OBGYNs and midwives is how important the research units actually are for progress too, and that they need to be big and they need to be clean. And um, we know that it takes time for them to do that. I think along those lines, there was one question at the end here about the informed consent. I think Marcy, you touched upon this in your in your talk, but just in case um, the question is about the main differences of the informed consent with you know the intention to donate for just transplant versus advanced therapies. And I think you touched on, I hope, and I think these slides are the whole recording will be made available later, but you touched on what to put in the consent, yes, for for that purpose. Sure. I think you just want to make sure that you're transparent with the donors about what could happen, right? And and um, make sure that they understand the different things that could potentially happen between uh, using it for research and and that it could go to a third party. I think that's the other piece that's that's important to mention. Great. I th I think we're running out of time. I want to be respectful of everybody's time who attended the webinar and thank all of you for joining. I want to remind you that if you want to hear more about Cord Blood, come to the Cord Blood Connect meeting and even submit an abstract, which will take you even further. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to the speakers. Um, thank you for a great session. Um, and we'll see you again at our next webinar. Take care, everybody. <laughs>